Are you ready for battle? Our enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, just looking for someone to devour. We need to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We have to put on the full armor of God. Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Put on the helmet of salvation with the breastplate of righteousness in place and your feet fitted with the gospel of peace. Take up the shield of faith against the enemy's arrows. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Remember, be constant in prayer and alert. And with the power of the spirit, you will win the battle. For years, guests would come over to the Hanson household to see Pippa, the family's small terrier dog, who would chase after and torment a crocodile that lived in the pond behind their property. The sight was so funny that news networks came out and filmed Hanson, the crocodile scaring terrier, who would fiercely run out of the house at the owner's encouragement barking as the crocodile fled back into the water. You see, it was captivating. A 10-foot crocodile, large enough to kill a human, was fleeing from this little fluffy dog. And then one day, guests were over, phones were out recording, as it was time to see the feed again. And well, you guessed it. A crocodile was a crocodile. You see, so often we joke and play with our sin, ignoring the danger, disregarding the nature of the enemy and the battle that we are in. We scream in horror after it's far too late. Satan's already inflicted devastating damage. We've been walking through the book of Ephesians, and now we're at the conclusion here in Ephesians chapter 6, and God is continually reminding us that we're in the middle of spiritual warfare, and he is offering us his armor, charging us, put on his armor. Last week, we walked through the belt of truth. And we saw that God's word is truth for our preparation to feed ourselves and our mind the truth of who God is. And now this morning, we're going to see the second piece of armor, that Christ offers us his righteousness, that he commands us to put on and to wear as a protector. So listen as I read in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to begin in verse 10, but our new piece of armor is found in verse 14. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of of righteousness. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, we pause to confess how little we genuinely consider the deep dangers of our sin. Father, we beg for you to convict us in a way God, that allows us to see the seriousness of the battle that we are in and reminds us, oh, Christ, remind us how often we can run back to the feet of the cross, that we can kneel at the foot of the cross and we can, we can confess our sin and, and your righteousness covers us again and again and again. As Mark prayed, that it is from 
the victory that you give us, that we fight, that we walk. Everything is from you. It is through you and it is back to you. So Father, we come to your word and we beg for your spirit to teach us, to quicken our minds and our understanding about what you are calling us to and how you are calling us to live. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Who do you think you are claiming to be a Christian? If they knew some of the hate-filled thoughts that ran through your head, they'd never come near you. Do you remember how deeply your wounds have, uh, your words have cut? Do you remember? When you lashed out with hostility right to her face, she has never recovered and gotten over that. Your home is a wreck. I don't know why you pretend in public like your marriage is all together. It's a sham. And your children, they don't respect you. They barely tolerate you. If people knew what you looked at on the internet and how you view them throughout the day, they would never look you in the eyes again. The way you objectify women, you are selfishly broken beyond repair. Listen to me, your enemy hates you. He is the accuser. Who do you think you are, he screams, with your constant pride and your dirty little secrets. How could you ever be forgiven for those skeletons in your closet? He hates you, he accuses you, and he wants to pull those out over and over and over again and remind you that you do not deserve to be forgiven. He knows your every weakness. Blow after blow. And you know what makes it so effective? It's all true. It's all true. I've said this before. Every one of us would be shamed beyond belief if our thought life was on display for all to see. Imagine being this guy, Steve Frazier, dumped by both girlfriends with a sign over the freeway. You say he deserves what he gets. Well, so do we. And the Bible says that if you and I were to stand against the accusations of the enemy, we are standing in filthy rags. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean. For all of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. All of us wither like a leaf. All of our iniquities like the wind take us away. What do filthy rags do for us in the midst of the battle? Nothing. Nothing. And yet on your own, that is you and I standing there in filthy rags. This is why our Savior has rendered the heavens do you remember the context of Isaiah 59? Remember, God is in the heavens and we are separated from him because of our sin and our iniquity. And he looks down. He looks to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for someone who might be able to save, who might be able to bring hope. But there is no one. And so he says, I will come down. I will rend the heavens. I will put on my own armor. And he puts on his breastplate of righteousness and his helmet of salvation and his mighty arm comes down and saves. He does what only he can do. He brings hope. He brings justice. He brings righteousness. He sends his son. 
What's so beautiful about the passion accounts, that is Jesus' suffering, his crucifixion, is that they are filled with illustrations of the gospel. And one that's been long understood by Christians has been the picture of Barabbas. There he stands. A notorious thief with blood on his hands because of the recent insurrection. He was angry, hopeless, and haunted by the things that he had done. And standing to his right was the perfect son of God. Pilate found no fault in him. It was clearly obvious That the Jewish leaders had an agenda. They were just trying to get rid of him. In fact, Pilate's wife had even been warned in a dream. This was a righteous man. Imagine for a moment that Barabbas can see from God's perspective. That the veil is pulled back. And he can glance to his right and he can see Jesus standing there in all of his righteousness. A brilliant white robe, perfectly clean. And he looks down at his own account and he can see the millions upon millions upon millions of sins as he stands there. And then the call is read. Who shall be forgiven? Who shall be set free and declared legally free from all of his sins and charges? Again, imagine with me that Barabbas can hear with spiritual ears and his head drops because he knows. He knows he is about to receive the condemnation that he fully deserves. And then suddenly his head is lifted as the crowd shouts out his name. His name to be freed. His name to be released. While Jesus, the righteous one, is covered in his sins. Why? Why? How is this fair? How could this possibly be? Jesus, who was completely innocent, would die. And Barabbas, a known murderer, is now breathing borrowed breath. And yet, as you and, as you and I, as believers, know, this was all according to God's plan. The righteous Son of God, dying for the sinner to set the prisoner free. And metaphorically, I am Barabbas, equally dead in my sin. And Jesus has exchanged my sin, taking it upon himself, the punishment that I deserve. And in exchange, he has given me his righteousness. He has clothed me, made me perfectly clean, washed my sins white as snow. Where I should hear the account of all of my sins. Instead, I am set free. Theologically, we call this imputed righteousness. Standing in the official court before God, the holy king, the holy creator. And being declared perfectly, absolutely clean. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Switching accounts, it is credited towards me. So when the enemy comes and reminds me of my sin and my guilt and my shame, I say with Martin Luther, I admit it. I deserve death and hell. What for it? 
For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. And where he is, he says, I shall be also. The righteousness of God attributed to me. I am Barabbas. Listen to me. Friend, do you know what you are trusting in when you have to stand before God Almighty? Do you know? If you are trusting in your own good works, if you are trusting in being better than someone else, just slightly better, if you are trusting in anything except the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You are trusting in filthy rags. Listen to me. You can now call upon him. Right now, you can call upon his name. He has given his son so that you might be forgiven and redeemed. You can trust in his finished work on the cross. And you can know as a free gift that he gifts you his righteousness. My sin. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Friend, do you know, do you know that you know that you know that you've been born again? That you have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Because you can call upon him right now. You see, you can just imagine Paul sitting in the Roman jail, thinking through the Christian life as he notices the Roman guard and the armor that he's wearing. He stares at the breastplate, a solid metal piece that covers the chest of the soldier. Its purpose is to guard against close hand-to-hand combat, specifically The short sword. When you are in hand-to-hand combat, the short Roman sword, that breastplate covers it. And Paul's mind begins to race about the way that our enemy constantly is attacking us. And he thinks, that's it. Christians, put on Christ's righteousness. Anytime the enemy attacks and says, who do you think you are? Put on Christ's righteousness. See, because without it, you have no defense. But with it, there is no attack. For he has forgiven all. You can also imagine that as Paul stands there and he thinks through, you understand that his aim for the Christian is a step further also. Not only just remember that Christ has forgiven you in the courts of heaven, but a step further. You see, the press is that you and I as Christians are called to daily put on the armor of God and the righteousness of God. Because daily the battle rages on, and this is what we're charged. So let me state this plainly. We live in a day of cheap grace, where much is made of Jesus forgiving us in the end, and very little is made of actually Christians walking out in righteousness. And then we're surprised at the heavy cost of our sin. Listen to me. There is real, substantial consequences for sin, even believers. My best friend in junior high caught his father having an affair. 
And at 12 years of age, he was the one who caught him. And I happened to go over to his house. We spent almost every waking minute together shortly after it occurred. It is still seared in my mind what it was like to walk in his room. A 12-year-old boy couldn't possibly understand all that was taking place. And over the years, I began to see my friend distance himself and distance himself and distance himself. Through high school, he was the life of the party, and yet I could see this hollowness inside of him. I don't know what happened to him. I've lost contact with him. I genuinely do not know where he is or how he is. Are the consequences any less because his father is a Christian and has his sins forgiven before the final judgment day? Are the consequences any less? The reality is, is there are always consequences for our sins. And they cannot be ignored. They are real. There are great casualties. In 1628, Captain Hansen took the helm of the Swedish warship Vesa and set sail on its maiden voyage. Thousands watched as the ship fired its cannons with all of the pomp and circumstances befitting of a ship in the Royal Navy. The king himself had ordered construction of this ship, giving specific building instructions and sparing no expense. Beautify the vessel. Make it as awesome as it possibly could. So for more than two years... Six of the most prestigious sculptors of the day labored intensively to craft an elaborate, ornate sculptures that adorned the vessel. Few ships would ever touch the aesthetic appeal. It was truly breathtaking. And as the ship set sail, a light breeze cooled the faces of the crew and spectators when suddenly a gust of wind flipped into the ship's sails and rocked it just enough to begin to allow water to gushing into its gun ports. Less than a nautical mile into its voyage, the Vesa sank and 50 people died. You see, the builders had labored exclusively over the ship's external appeal. Fueled by hunger for the world's applause, They neglected to adequately attend to the ship's internal structure. The ballast, which is the weight at the bottom of the ship, just wasn't heavy enough. And well, whoever actually looks in and goes, you know what? That sure is a good looking ballast. When I think of the state of Christianity in our day and time, I think of how Fancy everything is, but how little weight and true substance is often behind us. Where are the men and women of character and righteousness? How many celebrity pastors need to fall before we stop valuing talent over proven character and righteousness? When are we going to start allowing God to fight our battles over a long game rather than a flash in the pan? Our world is full of flash in the pan and and what is the next big thing? Do you know what this is a picture of right here? That is a click farm where people drive traffic towards Websites or advertisement. They make things go viral. This is a picture of our world. It is a mirage. It's not real advertisement. It's not real interest. Rather, it's just click, 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 click. 
What a time for Christians to be different, to have a weight to them, a righteousness, a consistency through trial, to persevere, to be men and women of character. I love reading about Christian heroes from the past because they endured persecution and remain righteous. They put on Christ's armor and walked it out. Did you know that John Bunyan, a classic author of Pilgrim's Progress and many others, did you know he suffered greatly? In his personal life, his eldest daughter was blind and his wife, mother of his four children, died. He soon remarried But it was shortly after that when the Church of England came and arrested him and 2,000 other pastors for teaching nonconformist Baptist doctrine. It was illegal to preach Baptist doctrine. He would spend 12 years away from his new wife, four kids, and that blind daughter that he wrote about often because she had a very tender, special place in his heart. Now listen to this. They would let him go if he promised not to preach anymore. You can be free, but you can't preach anymore. And he said, I cannot. I cannot stop doing what God has called me to do. And so for 12 years, he remained in prison. And he ended up writing many of the beloved works that we now have because he stayed faithful. Talk about putting on Christ, breastplate of righteousness, being a man of character, and trusting God to fight his battles. You see, righteousness is the truth that we believe being acted out in life, doing what we know to be true, even if there's a cost to it, having character and integrity. Do our actions match what we believe or are we fake? Satan wants nothing more than to disqualify your ministry. I'm not talking about on judgment day because Christ has already covered that. And so, and so what is Satan's aim with you? It is to distract you and to disqualify you, to waste your time, make you ineffective from the mission that God wants you for. You see, in the game of life called chess, God wants to be able to move you around strategically where he needs you. He wants you to put on his armor so that you can be used effectively to battle and so that he can get the glory. And Satan's sly, cunning aim is to take you off the board that you would be nullified. You see, there's a reason that the breastplate is given as image because it stops the short sword, the hand-to-hand combat battle. Because listen to me, most of our battle over righteousness in this life is in the daily grind. It's the slow fade, not the one-time decisions. You see, my, my, my friend's father did not have an affair in one day. The culture of our home is not a one-time decision. It is the slow fade, the daily grind, the attacks of righteousness in the small hidden sins. As 1 Peter 2.11 says that wage war against the soul. Hey, who's really hurt by you looking at those images? You don't really need to think about why you're afraid and anxious and trust the Lord. Just avoid all of that stuff. Man, you're justified for that explosion of anger. She doesn't respect you. And you know what? She never will until you put your foot down and you show her that she needs to respect you. You see, it's in the daily 
hidden sins of pride and ingratitude and discontentment where the battle rages on undetected. Seriously, ask yourself this. When was the last time you surrendered to being discontent? Where you said, you know what? I'm just feeding myself comfort food or comfort entertainment, but the reality of my heart is my heart is discontent right now, and I need to put these things down, and I need to go to the foot of the cross where I find true contentment. When was the last time you said to your heart, I am discontent? See, Satan's aim is to distract and to separate us further and further from what you know is true, from your lived out reality, allowing us to walk in unrighteousness. He does not want us to go back to him. But listen to me, that's the point of this whole passage. It's never been about your strength. Christ has rendered the heavens. He has come down. He has proved perfect uh, perfect righteousness. And he is now offering you, put on my armor. Put it on. Christ has not abandoned you. He's not only covered you completely, he is offering you daily his armor. So you say, all right, pastor, I get the whole metaphor of we're in a battle and I'm supposed to put on Christ's armor. I don't know what that looks like in daily life. I mean, I don't genuinely feel like, you know, I'm strapping on armor. So I spent all week praying and genuinely seeking so that I could give you handles right here at this moment on what it looks like for us to put on Christ's righteousness, okay? Metaphors aside, how do you put on the breastplate of righteousness? I'm gonna speak plainly. If you wanna go back and you wanna study this, study Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. Because in there, he talks about putting on the new self and he gives great detail in there but this is what he says okay before you came to faith in Christ you had a callous heart you didn't chase after God you didn't desire the things of God you couldn't you could only view things through the through the lens of what's in it for me And you were selfish. And for that matter, your mind went down selfish lines of thinking. Always, what's in it for me? That was you before Christ. The scripture says your God was your appetite. You did whatever you wanted. But then Christ came. And he saved you. And part of that salvation is he pulled out that heart of stone and he inserted a heart of flesh. A heart that now beats for God. A heart that now can be sensitive to the leading of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. A heart that now has the ability to discern when you are moving away from God. You can sense that. A heart that can now discern, when am I allowing good things like food to become a God thing, to become an idol in my heart where I'm running to it out of discontentment? You now have a heart that can discern that. You now have a heart that can discern. You know what? That outburst of anger, the the, the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. That was wrong. And you, because you now have a heart that beats for God, you can hit the reset button at any time. Do you hear me? You can run back to the righteousness of Christ any time. 
That's what it means to put on the righteousness. You understand, wait a second, I can sense in my heart, but, but listen to me. If you do not keep a sensitive, soft heart towards the Lord, you will become callous. You cannot walk in sin and not harden your heart. You have to move away from God when you walk in sin. But because you have a new heart, you can sense when that's occurring and you can go hit the reset button over and over and over and over again. This is what it means to walk in the righteousness and to put on the righteousness. It means I want you to wake up daily and ask the question, am I sensitive? Do I have a soft heart towards the Lord? Am I allowing him to convict me and to correct me through his word in my life? Is the spirit able to tap? Uh, 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 don't go there. And am I sensitive to it? And do I constantly run back, not to my own righteousness, but do I run back to Christ's righteousness? Do you understand that? It's a deep theological truth. I'm trying to let you know daily, this is what it looks like to put on the breastplate of righteousness. You say, is my heart soft and sensitive towards him? Am I allowing his word to convict me? And do I run back under the umbrella of Christ has covered it all? Christ has covered it all. Christ has covered it all. Imagine with me you purchase an 80-year-old home. That's in need of a little TLC. Right? So at first, as you move in, there's going to be some immediate kind of state of emergency fixes. You got to get that roof fixed and the plumbing in the house so that your family can move in. And then as time goes by and money affords, you go through from room to room replacing flooring, installing new light fixtures, replacing the hardware, repairing broken pipes, and eventually, day by day, piece by piece, the entire house is made new. The old is gone, and the new has come. That's what it's like to put on Christ's righteousness. When I was 15 years old, he moved into this fixer-upper of a house. And in his kindness, he certainly dealt with emergency situations first. And there is help in the battle of crisis and deep entrenched addiction and warfare. And he was able to root those things out. And also in his kindness... He just goes from room to room to room, pulling out the old. Sometimes it hurts as he chisels away at it and replacing it with new. From room to room to room, in over 25 years, you're able to look back and go, you know what? Jason, you're not quite the same. In the end, I would tell you, it's because I trust the carpenter. Church, trust the carpenter. Amen. Surrender to the carpenter. Be sensitive to his leading. Kneel in your heart of hearts. Put on his righteousness, never trusting in your own, always putting on his righteousness because the battle rages on all around you. Will you pray with me? King Jesus, right now we surrender to you. In our lives and in our hearts, we welcome and we give you access to go from room to room to room. To go into our closets and to pull out and to allow us to forgive and to heal. Because we trust you. 
where the enemy wants to go into our closets and wants to stir up strife and wants to cause us shame and hurt and continue to dig those wounds deeper and deeper, you, King Jesus, you go in there and you redeem and you forgive. You take us just as we are and then you heal us and you replace us and you make us new. Heavenly Father, all across this room, would you do business with your sons and daughters as they kneel before you? Would you convict those that are far away from you? Would you call them home? Reminding them to come and kneel at the foot of your cross where there is always forgiveness. There is always a way forward. And would you help us, Father, to walk worthy of you? Jesus, we want to walk in your righteousness. Help us daily. For the battle rages on. And there's so much at stake. Forgive us, Jesus, for taking our sins so lightly and for playing with it as if it wouldn't kill us because it killed you. Jesus, we pray all of this in your name. Amen.